This story uh, goes a long way back and requires an explanation of how things were in hospitals in 1963. If you're too young to remember, this is the way it was. There were no ICUs, no ventilators, certainly none for children, except for some old iron lungs in the basements. The sickest patients had either private duty nurses or a staff nurse that stayed with them all the time. A premature infant under three pounds with immature lungs usually didn't survive. So that's the background. As many of you know, I was a nurse before I went to medical school. There were advantages to this as I was able to help with, with the cost of medical school by working as a nurse during at least the first two years. There were some problems with this change of careers. Many of my nursing colleagues saw my going into medicine as traitorous. Uh, the 50s saw a lot of anger at, nurses, at doctors by nurses who felt put down by them and badly treated. The good news was that the director of nurses, Marcella Feinauer, at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where I had been a staff nurse, uh, was an enthusiastic supporter of my decision to go to medical school. So she told me that she would pay me top money anytime I wanted to do a shift or two. So I would occasionally work two shifts on a weekend, often being the nurse for a critically ill child. But the summer after, in the summer after my first year, I worked full time in the small burn unit, the recovery room in the infectious disease ward, subbing for vacationing nurses. But after the second year, I decided to be more adventurous. My brother lived in Boston and was on the faculty at MIT. I had gone up there at Christmas and I went to talk to the director of nurses at the Children's Hospital of Boston, the Harvard Hospital. I explained my experience and said I would be happy to supply Rex or whatever she needed to verify that I was competent. And she was quite receptive. And we discussed the timing. I would be there nearly 10 weeks. Of course, I was not licensed in Massachusetts, but she said she could handle that. So after some continued document exchanges with which Ms. Feinauer helped a great deal, I was hired um, and and was to go in June. So my idea about this summer was that I would have a chance to go sailing, my brother had a sailboat, or to the beach, or be a tourist in a city that I didn't know on my days off, or even the evenings or mornings when I wasn't busy. When I arrived, I was greeted by the director of nursing and the day supervisor, Miss Green. Ms. Green was somewhat standoffish and didn't seem exactly thrilled to have me join her staff. She told me that I could choose two shifts which would alternate weeks. And the choices were days, 7, to, 7 to 3.30, 3.30 uh, evening, 3.30 to 11, and nights 11 to 7. I chose days and evenings. I was to spend the first week on days and be assigned to the older children's ward, Division 37 so that I could get to the hospital, get used to the hospital and the routines, and I started two days later. I had driven to Boston in my 1957 VW Beetle, so I had transportation, if not elegant stuff, but, and parking for the hospital was in a garage across the street. The first week went well, and for the most part, the nurses and residents were helpful, and I thought the summer would be good. When the first weekend came, I went off to hike the Freedom Trail, and I saw some of old Boston. And over uh, the evenings and things, my brother and sister-in-law did a job teaching me my way around the city. Then when I came in on Monday, Miss Green came to talk to me. She said she had good reports about me, and so I now would get my assignment. After another week on days, I would go on nights. I protested that I didn't mind doing the odd week of nights, but all summer, she said, we don't actually need you much on the other ships, and walked out. So the summer went on, and I did get an occasional sail and one visit to Cape Cod, but my biological clock was so mixed up, it was hard to do much except work and kind of hang around. 
Finally, in my last week, there was a major event that made my last four nights memorable. The great advantage of marking nights is that we were allowed to park on the streets lining the hospital buildings where the administration and doctors had assigned places since they weren't there during the night. And so on this late August night, I drove down the uh, Longwood Avenue and turned right to go to one of the parking places and I was met by a policeman directing me to the curb. A man in a black business suit came to the window and showed me a badge which actually didn't enlighten me. Then he said, I will be parking your car and someone will get it for you when you leave. I said, who are you? And he said, Secret Service man. I got out with my stuff and he took my key ring, put a tag on, the, on it and wrote my name on it and tied it to the key ring and told me to go in. Uh, so I did. <laughs> Inside the emergency room, which is the entrance where I was, I was quickly informed that the president, President Kennedy's baby was in the hospital. It certainly hadn't made the news yet because I had seen the seven o'clock news that evening. Well, the word in the hospital spreads like wildfire, right? The Kennedys were at their compound on Cape Cod, and Mrs. Kennedy went into labor at seven months of her pregnancy. She was taken to Andrews Air Force Base, where she delivered her baby, Patrick, that morning. The baby weighed a little over two and a half pounds. Someone was uh, evidently, some time was evidently spent trying to locate neonatologists to care for the baby. And as it happened, there were only two neonatologists at Harvard and they were on vacation. Eventually, a private practitioner who had been a sort of part-time third uh, neonatologist at Boston Lying Inn uh, was contacted. His name was Jim Drobaugh. And he was called into Children's, and the baby he was transported there just a couple of hours before I arrived. I think all of us knew that if the baby was in respiratory trouble, he was, he probably wouldn't make it. Although no, almost no preemies under three pounds survived if their lungs were not mature enough to cope with extra uterine life. This baby was going to soon be getting way too much attention. It was quickly known that the nurse with the baby was an experienced newborn nurse and had worked with Dr. Dorba before. On my ward, which are children from uh, seven to, to teenagers, all was calm as the children were mostly asleep. And I just managed as usual, waiting hopefully for my relief at 2 a.m. when I could go to lunch or dinner, or whatever it is in the middle of the night, uh, for my break. At last, I'm sure we all knew that the, cafeteria, that the cafeteria would be the place to get all the news and about the baby and the famous family to which he belonged. Sure enough, the dining room was being transformed. Half of it was now lines of parallel tables and on each one, workers were at putting uh, telephone lines, telephones and telephone lines. The other half of the cafeteria was left to us workers. And what I learned was that the baby was indeed in some respiratory distress and was getting the usual treatment of the day, which was mostly nutrition and oxygen. When even while we spent our half hour, the tables on the other side began filling up with men and typewriters. The press was arriving in droves. The rest of the night, I was in darkness as far as knowing what was going on. And the next morning, when I went down again to the emergency room, there was my car parked across the street with the keys in the ignition. So it was kind of handy having, you know, valet parking. <laughs> and uh, the rest of the night staff were all hunting up and down the street to find their cars. In any event, the next night, after having my car parked, and getting to work on Division 37, I was caught up by the evening staff who told me the news. The baby wasn't doing well, and four Harvard faculty were now taking all outside calls from doctors, faith healers, 
and other people suggesting treatment plans or other ways to help the baby. And these were coming from all over the world. Uh, the other news was that Pierre Salinger, the press uh, officer, was now circulating in the cafeteria, and myriad reporters had appeared. Uh, around midnight, after I'd gotten seen all the patients, the night supervisor came by and I asked her how the Kennedy baby was doing, and she told me it wasn't professional to talk about patients who are not on my service, so I could just get the news from radio or newspaper. <laughs> That's how friendly she was. Then she said, I need a single room with an adult bed in it to be made into a sort of hotel room as Robert Kennedy, the president's brother, is coming and wants to stay at the hospital full time. Well, the only single room <laughs> of a patient who was, was uh, had a patient who was recovering from osteomyelitis, a bone infection. So he was in general healthy, but he was just getting intravenous antibiotics. He was 16. And I'd love to have had a video of him. And uh, so he, I woke him and told him that Mr. Robert Kennedy needed his room. And he was real, really excited. He said, will I meet him? You know, can I see him? And I, then I told him that uh, I didn't know the answer to those questions, but I said, if he's here and you're here, you can see him, right? Anyway, uh, then I had told the bad news. The only other kind of beds that were big enough for an adult were what we called junior cribs. They were, they were high off the floor. The, the mattress would have been four feet off the floor. So they had sides like a crib. But they were six by three, like a, a twin-size bed. When I told him that he had to be in a junior crib, he said, uh, I hope Mr. Kennedy will be comfortable. <laughs> he was really annoyed. Anyway, um, the supervisor found an actual table lamp as opposed to the usual room lights and several good pillows and a nice blanket and so we set up this hospital room. And, and then I went down for, late supper, for night supper it was just as I've been told. It was full of reporters and Mr. Salinger and various others. I recognized Chet Huntley and Roger Mudd among the reporters. Typing and talking on the phone seemed to be uh, accompanying many. And as any of you who had ever worked in a hospital, the woman in charge of the dining room at night, we had a conveyor belt and you'd, you'd bust your dishes back to the conveyor. So every... 15 minutes, she would stand up and said, will everyone please bust their dishes to the conveyor, including the reporters. And of course, there were thousands of cups of coffee and whatever all over there. I never saw any of them take anything to the conveyor. In any event, by this time I learned that the baby had been moved to the hyperbaric chamber, uh, which was astonishing. This obviously was an effort to put more oxygen in his blood, but it makes the patient more difficult to care for, and it doesn't add much as far as, as, far as I can see. As I made my last round of the ward at 6 a.m., the teenager was awake in his crib, and he said, was Mr. Kennedy comfortable? And I told him that he hadn't arrived, and he, and he didn't arrive. So the next morning, was the same as before, and the night proceeded as usual. The teenager was allowed to go back to his bed, so someone was happy. And then at 2 a.m., the chief resident, John Green, came to me and said, I need the death papers. These are a death certificate, autopsy permit, uh, up so, a consent forms, and funeral home release papers. They're all, they were all clipped together in a file. And since no one had died on my ward, <laughs> I took a wild guess and said, the Kennedy baby died. John said, I didn't say who these were for, and he stomped off with the papers. But they were, as was apparent, 
an hour later in, at the thin crowd of reporters in the cafeteria and the lack of official looking folk around the cafeteria at late supper. Hospital staff were beginning to clean up and dismantle the tables. So when my shift ended, I went to the emergency room where my car was usually waiting, but there were no Secret Service guys, no cars, and I had no idea where my car was. Several other night staff arrived, and together we searched, and we finally found a bulletin board against the wall of the waiting room with our keys all pinned to it. So the tags let us find our keys, but where were the cars? <laughs> finally, a hospital security officer came over and said that they had to be in the garage across the street. So we tripped over there, and then we had to walk. There were four floors in that garage, and so we all eventually found our cars, and we finally got to go home. That morning, uh, I could see on television and radio, and on the radio, the reports of the baby's death during the night, and saw a lot of the hospital activity was on, uh, on television at that time. The interesting part is that four years later, I went back to the Children's Hospital of Boston as a doctor. And the first day, I ran into Miss Green, the one who had made me work nights for a whole summer. Suddenly, she was obsequious and eager to be helpful. And, but it took a long time before I forgave her. And John Green, the, the chief resident who, who came and wouldn't tell me that was the Kennedy baby that had died, later, we later became friends and we all, we both reminisced about that four days in, in the Children's Hospital of Boston. It was really amazing how interesting and, and confusing it was in when I think everybody, including, I mean, certainly all the medical people, knew that, not, that it was not going to end well. And, uh, and interestingly, Dr. Drobaha, the, the man who, did, who was officially responsible for the baby, and Jackie Kennedy remained in contact all of her life. And she painted him a picture. I mean, they, and, and he really only met her after the baby had died. So anyway, that's my story.